I'm Ryan from Medium. I'm here with Ben Zweibelson. Uh, Ben's director of the U.S. Space Command Strategic Innovation Group and author of the new book, Understanding the Military Design Movement, War Change, and, and Innovation. Um, today, we're going to be discussing Ben's recent article from the Journal of Advanced Military Studies called The Singleton Paradox. But before we get into that, I was hoping you could shed some light on Space Command in general and the Strategic in Innovation Group and your role there. Thanks, Ryan, and I'm really happy to be here with Medium today. The Strategic Innovation Group, we, uh, well, first, you have at a combatant command level in senior level military organizations, these uh, relatively informal, small sort of like thinking and, and creative groups. Uh, one is called the Commander's Action Group or CAG, and the other is called the Strategic Innovation or Initiatives Group, SIG. So CAGs and SIGs generally work for four-star generals, and they do different functions. The SIG generally is your deep think tank. You're, you're uh, looking over the horizon, uh, looking at the organization, looking at uh, technological trends and all these different really interesting things that exceed the organic capacities of the general uh, organizational and their staff. Uh, and so that's what I provide for U.S. Space Command uh, here at Peterson uh, Space Force Base. Uh, and, and so for those unfamiliar with, uh, with Space Force and Space Command, so those are two different things. The Space Force uh, provides uh, uh, the personnel, equipment, technology, and things, just like the United States Air Force provides the people and the airplanes and the equipment. Uh, but the combatant commands are the ones that have to provide all the warfighter capabilities. And for this command, it's everything roughly 100 miles up all the way around the world and then out into cis lunar uh, space, which is massive. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the physics... Uh, of the space domain are profoundly different than terrestrial air, land, and sea. So this makes a really unique challenge for this organization. And, and I, as a SIG director, run a small team that provides um, some of these ideas about artificial intelligence and quantum and uh, new technologies, thinking about the main differently, looking at strategies, different operations, different planning, and, and so on and so forth. Very interesting. So. Today, as I mentioned, we're going to be discussing an article that you published recently in the Journal of, of Advanced Military Studies called The Singleton Paradox. Um, I was hoping you could define that term and level set. What is a singleton paradox or an AI singleton for anyone unfamiliar with the concept? Great. Now, uh, b before we dive into that, I just want to make one note for our listeners is that uh, uh, although I, I am the SIG director and I am here in, in the the Public Affairs Studio of the U.S. Space Command. Um, the things that we're going to talk about today, this is all Ben Zweibelson, the academic. These are my opinions, my thoughts, my ideas. A lot of this research does play into things that the Department of Defense is looking at, whether or not they're interested in what I'm writing or if other people are writing it. But for, for this discussion today, of course, none of this is an official position of the DOD uh, or, or U.S. Space Command. This is just Ben Zweibelson flapping his gums. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, most, most folks are not familiar with what a singleton is uh, whatsoever. So we, we should probably start there before we move into what a singleton paradox is. And so Nick Bostrom, who wrote a fantastic book called Superintelligence, you see right here. This book, I highly recommend to, to your viewers that are interested in artificial intelligence um, because he provides incredible um, blueprint of understanding all the different things that are happening uh, currently today, but also what's going on theoretically. And then the best part is Bostrom, I think better than anyone else, goes into the hypotheticals. And the distinction between theoretical and hypothetical is important. A singleton does not exist yet. And the thing that could create a singleton, which is artificial general intelligence or strong AI, that also is in the theoretical, but doesn't exist yet. So we really have to start there first, which is narrow AI, narrow artificial intelligence can do incredible things in a narrow specific way and outperform human beings. So when we saw Jeopardy and we saw Deep Blue from IBM defeat all the Jeopardy methods, right? Well, one of, the, one of the secrets behind that was they figured out, the programmers, that 99% of Jeopardy questions are Wikipedia topics. So what Deep Blue could do faster than anyone else is run through every single thing on Wikipedia and find answers that make sense. That's narrow AI. And the difference is that if in the middle of that Jeopardy game, 
Alex Trebek had changed the rules and said, guess what? You now get to do four daily doubles and you can triple your bet. The human players could immediately adapt. The programmers would have to stop Deep Blue, program in new code, and then let that narrow intelligence process that, right? So narrow intelligence is fragile. Where we are moving in the future is potentially towards general intelligence, which means that this AI can equal or exceed human beings in every possible category you could think of cognitively, from poetry to mathematics to physics to running errands to solving uh, world hunger and convincingly outperform humans. And that's general intelligence. Where we move from there is this notion of singleton that Nick Bostrom sets up and says, well, if you generate artificial intelligence, which he offers, there's a 10% chance uh, by 2040, but there's a 90% chance, he speculates, by 2090. And so this window here looks a lot like the space race and where we went from the Wright brothers in 1903, 66 years later, boots on the moon. So things can happen very quickly and fast. So for artificial intelligence, general intelligence would mean that that system, that entity, uh, can outperform humans, which means it will be at, at the optimum of our IQ, let's say 180. Now, the challenge here as we get into the hypothetical is that AI could very quickly, as you can see in large language models and, and chat GPT today, is as it's doing uh, supervised or in this case unsupervised machine learning, it could pull itself up by its own bootstraps. It could make itself smarter by learning how to do these things beyond the understanding of the programmers. Now, the challenge here is that once you go from 180 to 380, 380 IQ or to 1,000 IQ. This is beyond our comprehension. It breaks our biological and physical limits as human beings uh, living in space-time. And this goes into my other article at the JAMS website uh, that Elon Musk made that, uh, that famous comment that AI will soon see us humans as making long, nasally whale song as we're talking right now because they'll be able to process just so much faster at such bigger scales. So this AGI could, again, hypothetical, gain the ability to convince and persuade all human beings that it should be in charge. It could manage our world. It could take care of all of our security challenges, all of our uh, legal problems, everything about how a society runs. The singleton, as an entity, would artificially be that decision maker and control everything. And so that's what Bostrom says a singleton could be. And the distinction there is that in our human history, we've never really had one. We've had groups or individuals that have attempted briefly, dictators, uh, some very popular folks, uh, but they've never been able to, even as a polyboro or a group or a committee, they've never been able to do it in an enduring way or beyond one or, or, or several cultures or, or even in empires, uh, colonial empires. They weren't able to, to maintain it successfully. Now, artificial intelligence could change this. And that's where you get the idea of a singleton, and that would key into the next point in my paper, which is the singleton arms race. So we start with AGI, which is a step function past where we are today, and the singleton is another step function yet again past AGI, uh, the point where the AI becomes uh, self-reinforcing, uh, growing exponentially, uh, exceeding the capacities of human understanding and intelligence almost godlike, not to get too philosophical, but it seems like there's a, a, a version of interpretation of a singleton where uh, it might be viewed as such. But we'll avoid the uh, theological and philosophical. And I want to talk about this arms race concept that you mentioned. Um, there's, a, there's a paradox that uh, you discuss in, in the piece. Well, it's a, the piece is framed around this paradox. And so far as a singleton could usher in an era of peace and, and utopia, essentially, uh, but it could also usher in an era of war, uh, conflict, uh, and essentially the end of humanity. So how do you think about that uh, vast spectrum of outcomes and what they could mean? 
Well, first, I want to go back to the to the discussion about philosophy and religion, just just to make one a couple of points. And I, I can see in the chat area, uh, uh, Odale and uh, Kevin and a few others making some good points about, hey, this, you know, we've heard this before. Hollywood's very good at, at writing these horror technological stories. And uh, in what I'd like to uh, make two points really quick. One is that uh, when I've been writing and researching and doing this work, uh, I have gone into religion and I have gone into theology and philosophy because there's actually a lot of really good stuff out there, um, which is surprising because most people say, no, 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 you just need to read the technical stuff, reading AI and computer programming and all this stuff. That's where you need to focus. Uh, I just pushed an article to uh, one of my uh, research groups uh, just the other day called Apocalyptic AI. And it appears in a religious journal. The author is Geraci. For those of you, you can Google it very quickly and find it. And he, he actually talks about how human civilization, going back into all of our ancient religious beliefs, have always had these, these stories about humans being too clever and using technology and our own wittiness to um, invoke the wrath of your whatever deity you're talking about. And you can go into Icarus. You can talk about the Garden of Eden. Um, there's many different examples here which are interesting. And, and there's some value to that because we have to talk about philosophy because AI requires us to talk about ethics, morality, and legality because that does tie into this the, the point you want to go into on the singleton arms race. So the other thing I would also offer um, to, our, to our groups that are actively discussing in the chat, as I can uh, glance over and see, is that Hollywood normally gets this wrong. Uh, Hollywood loves to write, and it's because it's written by us, and it's, it's for us, it's not for the AI. But we like to write about uh, machine uh, technology, whether it's the Matrix or you're talking about uh, uh, Terminator, Skynet, these types of things, HAL 9000, there's just so many wonderful examples. But they all can be defeated by the cunning protagonist who is a human and always uh, the humans are able, Sarah Connor is always able to defeat the Terminators somehow, right? And this is where we get it wrong because we don't understand that artificial general intelligence is able to accelerate itself to an IQ of a thousand and beyond. It's outside of the ballpark. It turns into where your dog loves you. But when you leave in the morning to work, your dog doesn't know where you're going. They're, they're existing cognitively on a different plane. And so this is really the divide between us clever humans writing Hollywood stories about AI terror and true artificial intelligence that will view the world in a completely different way. But the singleton arms race is where this could begin. And if we think about nuclear arms races, the distinction here is that as horrific as nuclear weapons are, in the 1930s, when they still were, remember I said there's the practical, the theoretical, and then the hypothetical, well, atomic weaponry was hypothetical in the 1910s and then theoretical, really, after some of the great work by Einstein and others. But as you got into the 1930s, they were in the theoretical, which means that when German scientists were defecting out of Nazi Germany, they were warning the Americans and the Allies, look, this is possible. And all the research is out there. And if you don't develop a nuclear weapon before, say, the Germans do, this could be catastrophic. And these conversations happen. They're, they're a historical record. It's out there. And so the challenge with a singleton arms race is that, number one, just like the nuclear one, all the research is out there. There's nothing stopping any nation, group, or company, or enterprising uh, Tony Stark-esque individual from creating AGI. And if they're able to create AGI, leapfrog ahead of others, they could potentially open Pandora's box, if you will, and move towards a singleton. Now, the challenge with that is that if different rivaling or competing nations are aware, and once again, this is Ben Zweibelson's opinion, not the U.S. government, if they're aware of singleton development, then they may be prompted to develop their own first. And one of the concerns that Nick Bostrom offers in his book, uh, Superintelligence, is that the singleton itself, if it becomes aware, may view other budding singleton efforts as a threat and move to strike them. And here's the problem, the singleton paradox, is you can generate a nuclear weapon, which is a new means to your original ends. You want to create a weapon that can 
stop war or end the war on our terms, we go into Clausewitz, right? And that's exactly what the United States did by dropping two atomic weapons on Japan in 1945. A singleton is a new means to an ends of its own design. The weapon itself breaks war because the weapon is not just a weapon. It's not just a bomb that gets dropped that does horrific damage. It is a thinking entity that thinks beyond our abilities and therefore can generate its own ends independent and even beyond our accessibility. And Bostrom talks about this potential and what I promote in my articles is that this paradox uh, creates a whole bunch of different challenges that impact our security environment that may occur in the next 20 to 90 years. Uh, again, going back to Wright Brothers flew in 1903, 66, to later, 66 years later, just 66 years later, boots on the moon. And the kicker, for those of you that love the New York Times, is that three weeks before the Wright Brothers flew, you can look this up. In their editorial pages, a well-informed, educated person argued that manned flight heavier than air will not occur for another 10 million years. That's the only time the Times has ever been wrong. <laughs> but my point, though, is that we are in this period right now. We are in our 1930s, if you will, that the nuclear scientists were going through. But the challenge is that this is probably going to go faster. And unlike nuclear weapons, it require massive in infrastructure, very, very sophisticated technology, and uh, elusive, hard-to-obtain materials. What does AI require? What does it require? Well, it doesn't require the high bar of admission that a nuclear weapon does. There's certainly a high bar in terms of technology, creativity, uh, power systems, programming the right people. Uh, but, but this is something that exists digitally in ones and zeros, right now at least. And there's no limitation to that. That's why cyberspace is one of the most challenging areas for security forces today is because you are perpetually battling against entire nations that are doing things through proxies and surrogates. And you're also dealing with non-state groups that are incredibly powerful in what they can do and not do uh, in cyberspace. Using the arms race in World War II as a reference point, uh, you mentioned we were in a race against our rivals to develop the bomb first. We knew they were developing one. They knew we were. Essentially, whoever crossed that finish line first would win the war. And that is what happened. And of course, it's uh, you know more germane than it's been in a very long time because of the movie Oppenheimer. Uh, it's fresh on everyone's minds. Now, that in the Barbie movie. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, now, we know that every government with advanced technology is developing AI systems, right? So are they not already functionally building their way toward a singleton just by virtue of the fact that they are trying to advance their own AI tech faster than their rivals? Great question. I think what we have to clarify here is that there's a lot of different pieces on this playing field and a lot of them don't link in a, like a very linear causal way. This is what a lot of scientists uh, tend to get wrong. And uh, because they say, well, um, you're developing uh, large language models that's going to create uh, artificial general intelligence. And, and the fact of the matter is, no, no, it may not. It may inform and enable these things. Uh, but, but these are very, very kind of different uh, groupings, if you will. And one other area that, that Bostrom talks about, as well as a lot of other experts, uh, Ray uh, Kurzweil, uh, Werner Vinge, and many others, is uh, a, se a separate concept that does... If we want to do a Venn diagram between artificial intelligence, there's a, a concept called transhumanism or uh, moving towards a singularity. Uh, so singularity versus single singleton are different. But but here's the here's the distinction. When we've been talking about singletons right now, we're talking about some sort of entity. And in this case, we're talking artificial, but some sort of entity that could convincingly take over all decision making for our species for better or for worse, but it would be able to do it because it now is able to think and do far beyond what we can collectively, which again, is hypothetical. 
doesn't exist yet. When we're talking about human beings and transhumanism, that concept means that we as a species, you and I, we were born, uh, we have the genetics that we have. Now we can do some manipulation, we can do lots of different things with, with our bodies as we're alive. Uh, but biologically and physically in the world that we're in, we're, we're limited, we're restrained. And how, um, how our species changes over time takes thousands and thousands of years. Uh, for example, when we look at different types of dogs, like they all came from wolves and took a really long time to get a little chihuahua you can fit in a Paris Hilton's uh, uh, bag uh, versus a Great Dane. Uh, but that diversity took a very, very, very long time and it required a lot of attention of breeders to be able to get those things. Artificial intelligence can do that in almost no time. Again, hypothetically, right? On human species, though, let's go back to singularity. The singularity is what uh, Ray Kurzweil, Vern Vinge, and others say that this is the point where enough modifications occur that you have a new species. I I've used the term supra sapien. I like that, uh, but that's not a, a reference to uh, I'm Groot and his uh, the car that he drove in the Fast and the Furious. That's a different type of supra. But for my car, car fanatics out there, they might jump in the chat box on that. Uh, but it's but a transhumanism. Uh, deals with how do you modify a human? So you can do cybernetic enhancement, right? We can, we can start turning ourselves like into the board. Uh, but, but these things actually are legitimate. You can do a lot of different things. You can help blind people see. You can help people who are deaf or have no, uh, uh, weren't born with the right uh, organs for hearing. You can give them those abilities. But you can also take a person like us and modify us. You can modify a human to live in a uh, uh, a different uh, oxygen environment. Uh, if you want to have a species live in a different planet, um, you could potentially modify uh, DNA, genetics. You can do robotics. Uh, you can plug, and these are all hypotheticals, but we're moving there quick. You can plug your brain or connect it to massive servers that would supercharge charge your intelligence in a way that accelerates you beyond others. And so the case in point here is here's the, the security concern. The security concern is this. If you have a soldier in a tank on one side of the battlefield and a soldier in a tank from a different nation on the other side of the battlefield, and the soldier on this side, their society says, we are not going to ethically, morally, or legally do certain modifications. We're gonna train you. We're gonna give you the best equipment. We're gonna give you the best tech. But that human is an organic human like you and me, natural born. That we humans, even the best of us, we can keep track of six to seven things at once. Especially if my wife's telling me what she needs me to do this weekend, it drops. It drops really quick. So, so now think about it. There's, there are probably a couple of systems on the tank, and they, that person can maybe operate several drones, uh, depending on how they're supposed to control them, right? On the other side, you have a nation that has no scruples about doing genetic, cybernetic, robotic modifications to a soldier, even in vitro, right? And then that soldier potentially could control 50 things at once. Let's go low bar, just 50. Now say, who's gonna have the advantage? It doesn't mean one is gonna beat the other. That's not what I'm saying, because we have many examples in history. The Zulu warriors were able to defeat using spears and cowhide shields, uh, British armed with uh, our, uh, cannon uh, and repeating rifles. Right now, it cost them a ton of people to do that. Uh, but but that, but with, with conflicts, we have to think about what are we willing to do on this transhumanism side of things in terms of defense, and then what are adversaries, rivals, and other nations and groups may be willing to do that's beyond um, what what our societies might say. And that's an important hypothetical. Um, and when this ties to the singularity topic. That's when the, that human, that natural born human now becomes something that's so beyond our original species, you have to argue that now it's on a different plane. Could that person, that super empowered person become a singleton? Maybe, maybe. But what Bostrom and others offer is that really the faster way right now is, is probably through some sort of AI uh, emulation of a mind. And again, that's hypothetical moving the theoretical, but not yet existing. So it's an important distinction, a nuanced one. Uh, the singularity is reliant on some 
interfacing with a human. Uh, whereas the singleton might involve that, but also might not. Um, I've heard the argument made that we're already taking our first steps or have taken our first steps towards transhumanism insofar as we're attached to a device at all times. And that device is connected to the entire store of human knowledge throughout history. Um, now, it's external to ourselves and it requires uh, some input and our ability to uh, absorb that information is limited by the capacity of our brain. But it's not hard to imagine a, a not too distant future where uh, the phone is essentially integrated into ourselves, interfacing with our own minds, where we're able to uh, absorb information in a way that's uh, essentially unimaginable today. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. In, in the Wall Street Journal just the other day, uh, I think it was last week, they had a wonderful article that talked about human beings that are falling in love with their chatbots. And, and people have been talking about this and warning uh, about this. I think the term they use is artificial intimacy, which is a great term. I love it. I'm going to use it myself. So artificial intimacy is where these people, they're falling in love with uh, essentially Siri or Alexa uh, because it's providing the stimulation that, that we as humans extend because we socially construct reality atop an already existing complex natural reality. Um, but the challenge there is that the humans, we're fooling ourselves. Um, chatbot is not in love with you. Even though chatbot may be prompted to say the things that make us feel like, wow, this is exactly like a human being, it isn't. And that is a big distinction between what artificial general intelligence will be versus narrow intelligence that human beings are using right now. Military organizations as well as commercial uh, normally say human machine teaming. And so that dynamic goes back in history. If you go all the way back to the beginning of war, and I'm, I'm talking about defense and warfare specifically for AI, but of course this, this goes to everything, right? To, to how we live, to how we live our lives. But in, in terms of warfare, we started with muscle and natural power. So wind, sun, water power, and beast of burden and our muscles. That's what was used uh, for, for the majority of our existence. But the transition um, in the industrial, or just prior to the industrial revolution, you have this shift towards mechanizing uh, all the things that you used to do by muscle power. So sailing ships went to steam power. You know, we, we developed uh, internal combustion engines and all these different things. Firing a bullet is different than swinging a sword using chemicals and, uh, and, and metallurgy. Uh, so we as humans, didn't necessarily agree with a lot of these changes. And I'll give you a case in point. In the 1930s, the uh, militaries were struggling with the rise of aviation, and they were struggling with the development of combustion engines such as tanks, right? And this, those things existed in World War I, but in the interwar period, this is an area where the things were developing so quickly that no one could keep up. And so there were lots of arguments. And some of you might have heard of uh, uh, a General George Patton, famous famous uh, general in World War II, pearl-handled revolvers, very, very popular armor officer. Um, well, if you go and check online in 1930s Cavalry Magazine, a young major, George Patton, wrote two articles arguing that the horse-mounted cavalry soldier with his rifle and uh, sword, saber, that he designed in World War One, could defeat a tank and that they were superior, in a separate article, they were superior to aerial uh, reconnaissance. And General Patton, then Major Patton, was no slouch. He actually commanded the first uh, tank company in World War I and took the tanks completely apart and put them back together. Really understood the technology, but even for him, the institution of cavalry that goes back thousands of years was driving him and others to say, look, there's this new stuff out there that could change society and, and war, um, but our way of doing it that we identify with this is still going to be relevant it's still going to work and now take the the desire to make ca horsebound cavalry which by the way the polls did try in 1938 did not work out well extend that to artificial intelligence and human machine teaming we are now potentially mirroring that by saying humans must always be in command of everything on the battlefield well unfortunately the way these things are going and it might not be in the next 20 years, but it will be in the next 90 years, is that artificial intelligence will just be too fast. 
it'll be too powerful. The machines are going to be able to do so many things that it begs the question. And uh, Derdarian, who's a philosopher, and I saw a comment earlier by Kevin uh, asking about the, the importance of philosophy. Uh, Derdarian's a philosopher. I love his work. And he introduces the concept of virtuous war. And he says that uh, uh, war in this extreme, surgical, highly technical way could make war so sterile and clean that only, only the bad people that you want to eliminate it are taken out. There are no casualties. Nobody else gets hurt. And this virtuous war is what these Western technologically centric societies are going to want to move towards. Uh, and this is called technical rationalism. This is another term where, where we believe that the unlocking new technology is going to make everything much better and better and better. And we kind of ignore that, wow, some of, our, some of the things that we develop actually have a lot of negative consequences and it, it makes things difficult. But if you take the Daring's concept of virtuous war and fold it into this conversation, what happens if our technology becomes so significant in advance of the battlefields of tomorrow that there are no humans able to compete? It would be suicide for a natural born human to even show themselves on the battlefield because of the sophistication of AI machinery. Again, Ben Zweibelson saying this as a civilian academic, uh, this has nothing to do with the Department of Defense, but this stuff is all out there and you can read it right now. And, and so the challenge now becomes what conflict is today is designed by humans because we socially construct this reality that we all share including war we create what war is animals don't go to war there wasn't war until human beings walked the planet. the dinosaurs didn't have war so even though majority of the western uh, military believes that war is some sort of natural enduring thing uh like gravity uh, in chemistry um that's, that's uh, uh, unfortunately, five centuries of us following a Newtonian style of warfare. That's something that's slowly changing, and artificial intelligence will probably drag us there kicking and screaming. Because artificial intelligence, at a general level, may reconceptualize war in ways that we can't comprehend and change what war is. But will these weapons, if you want to call a singleton a weapon, be so powerful in, in ways, like you say, that are not necessarily comprehensible today, that uh, war would be over essentially before it started, uh, that they'd be able to do what they want. They're so beyond our capacity. If there was some asymmetrical advantage that one nation had over another with this technology, uh, would it not be over before it started and, and therefore uh, war would essentially not exist? It, it, again, it's, it's an interesting question. We, and once again, we're in philosophy, we're in the hypotheticals, we're, we're where Hollywood wants to be, but these types of stories won't sell movie tickets and popcorn. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that um, artificial intelligence, if we're going to try to project in abstraction what we can't comprehend, I think the best way is to kind of draw parallels between how we are versus other uh, sentient beings that already exist around us. Um, so one of the examples I use when I teach at War College is this, look, you know, we, you love your dog, you love your cat or whatever animal you have. Some people have pythons, um, some people have birds, um, but, but your animal at whatever level, and I like to use a dog, the dog loves you, lo enjoys being around you, you feed the dog, you have a great relationship, it's symbiotic, and, and it has been for thousands of years. Uh, wolves are different from dogs. Um, but when you leave to work, the dog doesn't know where you're going. They're just very happy when you come home. My dog loves when I get home. My kids and wife, maybe not as much. Uh, sometimes they don't pay attention. But my dog is always there, front and center, right at the door. Hey, you're home. Um, now think about ants. And this is where we get into the slippery slope of, is this a future that's a utopia without war? Or is this where Hollywood kind of goes off the, the spirals and, and, you know, there's Terminator robots crushing human skulls? Um, ants, if you see a trail of ants in your, in your backyard or, or in your driveway, you probably don't care. Because it's part of the ecosystem, ants. But if you find ants in your kitchen, what do you do, Ryan? You kill them. You wipe them up. Yeah. They're an inconvenience, right? But you and don't really think about the ants. No, no, okay. no. Now, um, if, if we think about this for a moment, um, 
uh, we even as some humans that really study ants, we put them in uh, habitats, artificial habitats. You can see ants in museums, uh, in certain zoos, uh, laboratories, right? The ants don't know, just like your dog doesn't really understand that you've left for work. Um, so these has to do with planes of existence that we conceptually can access versus planes of existence we cannot comprehend, that we cannot access. And those are all around you already. Uh, you, you and I don't live or think in an atomic world or even a cellular world. There are things mm -hmm. going on inside of our bodies right now that ha have no, um, they're important to us. It's scaled to that it does impact us, but we have no cognitive awareness of it. Um, you know, I, I always offer the, uh, you know, a snake eating a kitten. Everyone goes, whoa, that's terrible. Yes, it is terrible for us at the social level of reality on how we think kittens are cute and snakes are, are usually not. But for the snakes, the snake and the uh, kittens' uh, cells, it's, it's completely an arbitrary exchange of, of materials uh, in, a, in a consumption cycle, right? Prey, predator. And then at the molecular level, at the atomic level, snake, uh, kitten, doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter, right? These, these things are, it's a different plane. So let's go back to AI and let's go back to war. If AI moves into such a high level of general intelligence, that it not only breaks what war is, but the singleton takes control of, of reality of the world convincingly in that every single country would be persuaded to agree to it. Uh, and the Futurama did this once with one of their, one of their specials where uh, a, a giant creature with tentacles uh, convinces everyone to go on a date with them. Uh, but but this is, that's illustrated, that's a funny way of doing it, but really this is something where something so profound intelligent you out to you through your computer, your chatbot, and absolutely convince you and everyone else in your society that it should run the society. Now, if we're considered dogs, we probably will just live in a nice, comfortable, invisible prison. You wouldn't even know that you were in a prison. You wouldn't be able to see the bars. And some of those bars might restrict us from having war, organized violence. Our species just simply wouldn't do it anymore. That's, that's kind of the utopia option. Again, so the, the utopian option is actually us imprisoned. A prison that you don't even realize. Like, technically, I take my dog for a walk. I have to put him on a leash. Right. He doesn't, yeah. doesn't really care. And in the end, it benefits my dog because he doesn't get run over by a car. He doesn't run into a neighbor's yard. All these things. I'm taking care of my dog because I love our relationship. And I know that sounds terrible, but... Uh, general AI could move into where it's taking care of us. It's perhaps using us to help us expand through the galaxy. You can have all these wonderful sci-fi stories, but the reality is that it, it could potentially eliminate war and conflict because it simply dissolves, as Russell Acoff would say, dissolves those those problems for us. Um, you know, it, it, in the the other part, though, if we swing it to the other side of the paradox, is that we're viewed as ants. And so if we stay out of the way, we're fine. If we're a nuisance, well, that's not fine. And again, these are, this is all hypothetical. And in the same way that it doesn't occur to us, or at least to the average person, that we're taking lives when we're killing those ants in our kitchen, the AI would see us the same way. Right. And um, for those that are interested in, in looking at different types of uh, organizations and how they, they think. There's a fantastic book by Hofstrader. It's called uh, The Eternal Golden Braid. Um, Godel, Escher, and Bach came out in the mid-70s, won the Pulitzer Prize. It's just like Stephen Hawking's book. It won a Pulitzer Prize, and so many people bought it, but very few people read it. It's a very hard read. I tried. It, it is. Definitely not a beach read. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, but for our audience, if you stayed on this long and you're interested in this, right, it's an 800 page book where Hofstrader puts a pre chapter in front of each chapter because he goes into math and all these really difficult things. But the pre chapter is all metaphors. It's all these characters that are interacting. And in, in the area where he's explaining swarm intelligence, he uses an anteater as his one character. And then the ant colony is having this wonderful conversation, having tea, the ant colony and the anteater is eating some of the swarm. And the ant colony is fine with it. It's their way of communicating. And I know this sounds really crazy, but we're not comfortable with talking about different types of intelligence or different ways of perceiving complex reality because it's hardwired into us. 
we, we make all of our aliens in our science fiction adventures generally look like humans wearing rubber masks. And I say this as a devout Star Trek fan. Um, it, it's, it's not usually very useful because we're projecting ourselves into our entertainment. Uh, true artificial intelligence is going to look at the world differently than we do um, on so many different levels. And that's what a lot of scientists are talking about now. And this isn't hypothetical. This is theoretical. Uh, case in point, when uh, Facebook did an experiment, I think about three years ago, they, have, they asked the two computers to, uh, to do some processes and gave them a goal. Well, the computers quickly figured out they could get to the goal faster by changing their language. But the problem is then the programmers didn't know what the AI were doing. So they had to shut it down. And it wasn't a, oh, we got to shut it down. They're taking over the world. It was just that the, the AI Swift simply said, hey, you want me to do X? I can do X faster if I modify the language beyond the program. Right? Um, so these types of things are going to be uh, right and left turns away from what we were, our programmer's best intent was. And this will happen at a much more sophisticated, deeper level, potentially where we can't even anticipate the, the effects and that's where these things get really difficult. I want to go back to this notion of a race. So again, using uh, the arms race in World War II as a reference point, adversarial nations were working with generally the same set of knowledge, the same raw materials, the same tools available to them. Uh, it was a close race is my point. Uh, the outcome could have swung either way. Now, is it possible in a singleton arms race that the singleton technology uh, uh, on one side could hit an inflection point where it improves so exponentially fast that the race is essentially over? It's an, it's an interesting challenge, and it, it echoes the nuclear um, race in that we we didn't want to have nuclear proliferation and we st nobody still does really but there's that trade-off so uh, for example you look in the news today South Korea has declared they're, they they've said uh, recently that they're not going to develop nuclear weapons because they are under the umbrella of allies and partners even though they have North Korean adversaries that that are uh, nuclear armed right so there's that kind of that that tension that tension so if you apply that to artificial intelligence and we're talking if general AI is achieved. And in Bostrom's book, he talks about how um, programmers and scientists are going to try to create all these different elaborate boxes, if you will, to try to contain the superintelligence. Because frankly, as soon as something becomes more intelligent than us, it's very, very difficult for us to know whether it's deceiving us, whether it's manipulating us, any of these things, even including benign efforts uh, to do things in our favor, right? Um, in in my uh, in my second chapter of my book, uh, understanding uh, the military design movement, I talk about how uh, pre-modern militaries moved into modern militaries, but we carried a lot of our intellectual baggage with us. Uh, things that date all the way back to the feudal, and then much much further back into Greek and Roman periods. And a lot of these things are ritualized and they're habits. And one of the challenges with artificial intelligence is that if we choose to weaponize it in a particular way, right, is that going to inspire a nation who's in competition with us to do something as well? And we have an entire history of our, of our civilization. We're not very good at containing and stopping things, particularly technology or, or weapons, if you will, that, that provide a significant advantage to anyone that's on, on a battlefield. Now, and, so, and so that gets very difficult because we're now finally at the point where we're able to manipulate uh, many things that previous generations of us could only imagine, could only dream of. But now, now the technology can manipulate us. And it sounds like a loss of control is in inevitability. It goes hand in hand with the advancement of the technology itself. Oh, um, in the chat, uh, Lakshmi, yes, that is the book. So he's pulled up the Amazon, uh, Godel Escherbach. Uh, again, caution, it's a heavy read, but yeah. highly recommend. Um, but what's, what's very useful in um, th this challenge, uh, we're talking about the unavoidable application of AI to weapons. So that's already happening, right? We have, we have uh, weapon systems like the SeaWiz that can 
shoot down artillery. Uh, you have the Israeli uh, Iron Dome. Um, these things, uh, Antoine Bosquet, I'm going to throw another book at you all, The uh, Scientific Way of Warfare, fantastic book. It's out in its second edition. He's now a professor at this, um, the Swedish uh, Defense University in Stockholm and, and a good friend. And uh, Bosquet talks about how cybernetics is really the age in the 20th century uh, when militaries realized that they had to give some cognitive processes to machines. And so remember that resistance uh, of, of letting them think for us. Well, you first uh, started using uh, analog technology to move anti-aircraft weapons that, that sailors were shooting at airplanes in World War II, right? But it was, that was um, the pre-computer. The computerized version occurs in the Cold War. Because if you have intercontinental ballistic missiles moving, um, you've got to have these different systems that can can track it and, and do different things that your your society needs, right? Can't be done as a human. Can't be done as a human. Um, so as we start moving th these things into the, the machines making the decisions for us, this becomes a question of, all right, well, how far are you willing to go? So imagine, if you will, two spacecraft, unmanned, uh, you know, uh, autonomous spacecraft. And let's say they're weaponized. And let's say they move behind the shadow of Mars or behind the, the moon where we don't have communication with them. And one is from a, one nation, one's from a rival nation. There's four things that can come out on the other side of that orbit. They both come out okay and we're not talking about anything. Or one or the other is destroyed and there's an orbital debris trail. Or they're both destroyed. And so these generate ethical questions of how are we programming autonomous weapon systems, how sophisticated are they, how exquisite are they, what kind of decision-making trees are going to be built in, and then in the perpetual competition that humans do and that the history of war has, is there an advantage that is out there that requires you to change how you look at things ethically, morally, and legally? And these questions become existential because we now have weapons that can destroy all our species. And that's just the nuclear. The AI is gonna change this even more uh, uh, profoundly, I would argue. Last question, where do you see us on the spectrum today? And the reason I ask is you hear the most intelligent, experienced and qualified people in this field of AI technology development uh, fall down on both ends of the spectrum. One side says, we're fine. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, the uh, hype is fear driven. Uh, the other side says, we don't know what we're doing. And potentially, we've already lost control. Well, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this, uh, and I talk about this in, in my book, uh, the, Understanding the Military Design Movement. And I have this, uh, where I, this is about how design is how human beings create. It's how we transform the world. And there's, of course, many, most people are familiar with commercial design and all the different types. And I have that in the first chapter where I explain um, how we uh, have developed a, a modern form of design in the 20th century, and then how that's kind of woven into uh, war and conflict in societies. And it's, it's pretty fascinating. But the interesting thing about militaries is that they really didn't start doing the design stuff that everyone else was doing until the late 20th century. And one of the reasons for that is because I, I referenced the Newtonian style before, that the military organizations are kind of tied up still and, and, and straightjacketed in this older way of thinking about things, and that's how they approach warfare. Now, they use very, very exquisite, we use very, very technologically sophisticated things, but in terms of thinking about our thinking, we, we generally don't do that. We just continue to follow different processes that we believe uh, almost ritualistically um, that are the way things are. And artificial intelligence is what's potentially going to change a lot of that. And here's the optimist in me. The optimist is that AI is going to create some profoundly amazing opportunities for us as a species. I'm talking about uh, exploring the cosmos, uh, uh, utilizing commercial enterprise to uh, access uh, inner, the inner solar system in terms of living space and energy, uh, unlimited resources, and all these things that currently we're stuck with 
uh, on our planet are going to be changed and transformed. And AI is absolutely going to be so important to that. And in other ways, with designing extremely exquisite uh, designer drugs and molecules and treatments and genetic treatments, all these things are going to be done in the combination of quantum and high processing, uh, narrow, and then eventually general artificial intelligence. All this stuff is amazing. But here's the pessimist. So complexity science talks about emergence and is a term called downward causation, uh, which I think is useful to throw out here. So for millions of years, every 50 to 100 million years is a cycle where our planet gets hit by a, a uh, uh, existential uh, asteroid, right? Changes over, resets the planet. And, uh, and this has happened over and over and over. We know all the creators. Everyone knows 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs went bye-bye. And the reason they went bye-bye is because they couldn't stop that cycle. That was the, the current system. Uh, when you evolve uh, the system and change it, so emergence occurs, that's where us clever, ha hairless apes with our fingers and our brains, we were able to create uh, an atomic weapon or atomic technology. And everyone knows that Bruce Willis can go to the asteroid with his team with Mr. Pink from uh, Reservoir Dogs, and they can blow the asteroid up and save us, right? So the problem here, the problem here is that we have emerged into a new system that changes that cycle because it interrupts it. And the downward causation is that the threat of the asteroid doesn't go away, it's still there. But there's something new that the emergence has brought into this system that didn't exist before, which is our species now has the tool to stop the old cycle, and that tool can wipe us out before an asteroid even gets here. So if we've got 50 million years until the next asteroid comes, do you think that we're going to have success at not having a nuclear conflict in the next 50 years? I hope so as an optimist, but the scale of this is, is massive. And so if you think about these large scales of how the cosmos works and how complexity is, it's very, I think, naive to say that we're playing with, with a technology that could be extraordinarily changing, transformative, but it, it devastatingly destructive if we're not cognizant of how we're going to do this. And it's probably going to require international discourse at a level beyond even what we've been doing with nuclear uh, deterrence. That's my own personal opinion. Well, on that optimistic note, we'll <laughs> leave it there. Thank you so much. We could talk about this all day uh, and we've only scratched the surface. So a reminder to everyone in the room now and watching or listening to the replay later, there is a code to buy Ben's book, Understanding the Military Design Movement, uh, and a link to buy the book from his publisher. Ben, thank you so much. Uh, really fascinating and hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks so much. And uh, I'd say also that uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Ben Zweibelson. And I like to put up a lot of my research there. I don't I don't do cat photos or talk politics. Uh, and then on Medium, of course, uh, and, and you and I, were, Ryan, we were talking about this before. Uh, I think it's a great process in Medium. Throw your ideas out there, your rough ideas, get the feedback, have the interaction, share it. And then that can be refined because that's exactly what these two articles were uh, about a year and a half ago. They were on Medium. They were different, different little little blogs and, and kicking the ideas around. And I'm going to continue to do that. So I'd, I'd love to see more of you on Medium and in social media, and uh, and hopefully uh, uh, in the future we'll all uh, we'll have more to talk about. Thank you so much, Ben. We're lucky to have you writing on Medium. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it.